Welcome back to what it's really like to be an entrepreneur. I'm Vincent Lancey. And I'm Denise Berger. Whether you're already an entrepreneur, are looking to start your journey tomorrow, or just someone who needs a little extra motivation to get through the day, this is the perfect podcast for you. Each week, I interview a different entrepreneur from around the globe. My goal for this podcast is to help you realize that giving up is never an option. If you missed the last episode, be sure to download it after you tune in today. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate the show five stars and continue listening by subscribing. My guest on the show today is another product of networking. One of my many goals for the show is to feature entrepreneurs from as many different industries as I can in order to provide you all with a diverse selection of testimonials. You never know which story you will resonate with most. Today, we will jump into the jewelry industry with Denise Berger. Denise is both an MBA and Doctor of Education graduate and is streaming today from Los Angeles, California. Her core values are learning, well-being, connectedness, and responsibility and fun. Today's guest is an executive, advisor, board member, educator, turned entrepreneur, as she is the CEO and founder of Aliki Wear. Aliki Wear is a jewelry company that offers designs infused with positive intentions and meaningful impact for the person who is not satisfied with the mundane and prefers to create their own unique lifestyle. There is a lot of messages behind this jewelry and I'm excited for Denise to share it with you all. Allow me to please introduce Denise Berger. Denise, thank you for coming on the show. Um, thanks so much, Vincent, for having me on. I'm really excited um, to talk about both um, my uh, role in as a business executive and also as a founder and entrepreneur of Aliki Designs. We're looking forward to hearing it. Would you mind please introducing yourself to our listeners just a little more without giving too much away of your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, sure. Uh, I spent 17 years in corporate America working um, in international business on Fortune 500 companies. Um, I got my MBA in marketing and international business. And um, as part of running a large global group, I the, the part that I enjoyed the most was developing the people. That led me into getting my uh, doctorate in education in organizational leadership and focusing on corporate social responsibility. That led me into um, social entrepreneurship. And now I teach at Pepperdine in the social entrepreneurship master's program. And I teach in Vanderbilt's doctoral program all around leadership and leading inclusive organizations. I have to ask, which role of all of these roles you've been in was your favorite to be a part of? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I would say that, you know, it's really hard to answer in pinpoint one because they've all had so much value and worth to my personal pro progression, um, both professionally and, and you know, on a, on a side note. Um, I would say I most, I, I really enjoy the teaching. Um, I really enjoy helping people realize their full potential. So when I am doing that in whatever capacity it is, I'm the happiest and most fulfilled. That's awesome to hear. I'm really excited to see where this episode is going to go based on that <laughs> mentality. And it is time for the big five. On each episode, my guest and I will go over these five questions to help you the listeners learn what it's really like to be an entrepreneur. You ready to go? Yeah, sure. Bring right, it. So when did you realize that you either <laughs> weren't happy with what you were doing or you just needed some kind of change to truly start this entrepreneurial journey? I do see you've been happy throughout your career, so I'm excited for you to share this part of your story. What made you become an entrepreneur? Yeah. Um, well, so first of all, I have to backtrack to my days as an executive in New York. I was um, uh, in the World Trade Center on 9-11 um, and uh, on the 103rd floor, and fortunately, I survived. Um, and uh, a lot of people from my team did, but our boss, who was a one of, you know, a, just a stellar leader, did not. Um, and so we all kind of made a vow to ourselves that we would never let work and life get out of balance. And so 
um, afterwards, work got out of balance for me. And it was um, at a time when my kids were just entering elementary school and I was, it, it was just a confluence of events that helped me to pivot um, away from corporate and to think about like what's next for me. Um, in that process, I got my doctorate. And then after my doctorate, I found myself with nothing to do. <laughs> and and again, work and life were out of balance on the other side of the scale, right? Um, at the same time, I am half Greek and I spend my summers in Greece visiting family. That's awesome. And I came across some bracelet designs that you can only find in Greece. Um, they use a unique clasp and, you know, they're very hardy. So I... Um, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool to bring these to the US? My friends had been complimenting me on them and wanting me to get some. I tried to partner with a local vendor in Greece and that didn't pan out to sell their products. So I thought, you know what? I'm teaching in a social entrepreneurship program right now. I should be a social entrepreneur. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's not so much that I was unhappy, though in the back of my head, I always have this like work-life balance construct in my mindset. But at the same time, I saw an opportunity and I saw not only an opportunity to start my own business and do something really cool and bring something to um, our community that I haven't seen anywhere in the US, but also to just kind of practice what I preach um, and, and to really um, make it of value in more ways than one, you know, in more ways beyond just profit. I love that. I know for me, I was in that mindset of work, 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 not really worried about the balance. I went to school for finance and MBA and it comes up once in a while where I wanted this corner office my whole life with this job title. And then I realized who am I really doing this for? I got the job paying good money, young, wasn't really happy. The money didn't make me happy. So I kind of put this business into a higher gear and I haven't looked back. So I can definitely relate to you on that. But in your different types of business endeavors, specifically as an entrepreneur, what are the two most difficult things for you, Denise? Yeah. Um, great question. So number one, I would say, you know, I, I started my business later in life. So I, I'm not as young as you are. <laughs> um, and so one of the, you know, and my business is retail and um, the forum that it would do best in or, or could do best in is online because my, my bracelets are custom made to your wrist size. So you can order online, you can choose the color you want, you can um, pick the size you want. Um, and so, but as an, as a, as a middle-aged person, it's super difficult to break into the social media world. Um, as someone who is in their twenties, you know, it, they are able to grab a lot of followers effortlessly, but in my generation, it's not so easy. Um, and and I and I'm trying to figure out a way to tap into that younger generation that has that um, snowball effect. Yeah. Um, my generation, you know, it's spotty whether or not they're on social media. So, um, so that's been number one. And and part of my goal there is that I've done very well in selling um, to friends and friends of friends and word of mouth. Um, but I need to branch on off beyond that. Um, and. I was going, I had a plan in motion to do that for this spring, but the pandemic hit and just squashed mm -hmm. that. Yep. So that's number one. Number two is that I operate under the uh, just in time inventory model. Um, so I made an initial investment and I'm managing through like how to reinvest while still recouping my initial investment. Um, and so in order to do that, I have to operate in a just-in-time inventory model. I can't stock a lot of inventory um, without selling you know, more, than I, more than I have um, right. invested. So while I have been, I've only been in business for two and a half years and I'm already profitable in last year and this year, but I'm not profitable yet if you consider 
since I've initially started and that initial investment. So that that's the, the other challenge I have. Yeah, well, year one, it isn't about money. It's also the time we're putting in the non-monetized, you could say, resources we dedicate. In the beginning of this whole path, I had 15-hour days regularly, just grinding, grinding, grinding. Then I learned the importance of mental health breaks and all of that, where breaks yes. actually do prove to be a bit more valuable. But I would like to backtrack on the social media part you were talking about, mentioning how it's a little difficult for your age to just jump into the sector, maybe because it just nobody was on it as you were kids. But right. what are some ways you're overcoming this barrier for other people in your situation listening on? How are you uh, combating this obstacle? Well, um, like I said, um, the pandemic made me kind of pause for a minute, but yeah. um, I have intentions to um, tap into um, my, not necessarily my kids, because I don't want them to be um, sort of responsible for hawking my business, you know? Right, and, right, right, right. Um, feels a little self-serving. But I do intend to look at um, sort of like the internship model where uh, someone comes on board who's young, who's maybe looking for a resume Great booster, idea. and who can really be responsible for looking into how to strategically boost um, my, my hit to sales um, ratio online. So that, that is one um, area that I'm, I'm investigating. Um, Wonderful advice, I think. I mean, me especially, I am actively seeking an intern right now. However, without school dates definitively starting, it's tough to just offer college credits because kids aren't in school working on their degree. But I am in that same boat. I think it's very smart for you too because it's going to attack different markets, different demographics, give you fresh perspective. And something I've learned is we can't know everything. We can't be good at everything. We can, we can right. be good, but we can't be great at everything. So it is right. always good to get some fresh blood, fresh people in here. And I'm trying to do that as well. But looking back. Then yeah, that, that is definitely where I'm at right now. Like I, I uh, and I think it'd be a great, you know, with, with all the internships having uh, come to a halt with, with the pandemic, if I can provide something meaningful to someone to put on their resume, then it's a win-win. I like that. I feel the same way. But looking back, Denise, over your career, yeah. What is one of your greatest failures or lessons learned and what did it teach you? Why is it still stuck with you all the way up until today? Um, so <laughs> I probably had a lot of failures and I've learned and grown the most from them. And yep. uh, part of that process is accepting how much learning can happen in failure um, and recognizing its value. But I will say like kind of one of the greatest lessons I learned was, um, probably the act of learning. And what I mean is that like, so for this business that I started, I have done everything A to Z. I had, I make the, I figured out how to make the bracelets. I figured out how to source the material, both from LA and Greece. I figured out how to build the website. I figured out how to, you know, um, market myself on social media with, you know, you know, fun pictures and the hashtags and all of that. Um, I, you know, and and obviously I manage the budget. I I manage it, you know, very strictly. Um, I would also say that. I don't have like an official business plan. I know I need to put, probably that's the second thing I need to really do now that I'm in year, I'm approaching year three, I need a more of a structured business plan. But one of the things is that I've learned is, you know, not to wait for that. As an entrepreneur, you, you kind of have to dive in what, you know, and not like have all the ducks in order at least in year one to experiment and to try the market. You know, there's a motto called um, start small, scale fast, yes. right? So, so starting small and testing, you know, I did like little focus groups with like 10 designs to start with and, um, you know, and then just took it from there. So 
you know, I think the the adage of like if we if Microsoft waited until they were perfect, we'd still be waiting for 1.0 to come out. You know, so um, you yep. you don't have to have every little detail figured out when you first launch a business like this. Um, you know, the investment wasn't um, huge for me, so I didn't need investors to launch per se. So yep, I was able to kind of like. Uh, make certain smart decisions. I mean, I definitely did not dive into anything without carefully thinking through it or crafting right. it, but, but, um, but I didn't have it down on paper, you know, and all with a neat bow on it. Well, I think a great part of what you just shared is in entrepreneurship, you have to kind of wing it. Sometimes it's trial and error. It's fail, fix it up, fail again, fix it up again, tweak it a little bit. So I can definitely relate to you there. <laughs> yeah, and you know what, um, Vincent? The, I think that I learned the act of learning um, be, through, my, through my doctorate. I, I really, um, it was very interesting because I went into my doctorate and I had an MBA and people came to the doctorate from three different disciplines, um, business, psychology, or education. The psychology uh, folks had knew how to write in academic format, you know? The business folks knew how to do a, a really good PowerPoint presentation. And we each had to learn that craft in that doctorate. And it was one of the hardest challenges I've taken on. But when I finished my doctorate and, and I loved my dissertation, my committee loved my dissertation, the findings are still relevant today. Um, I know that no matter what I do now, if I don't know how to do it, I know how to, I know I can figure it out. Like I have confidence in myself that I know I can figure out anything. Yeah, I can relate a little bit. When I went for my MBA, that's where I really became, I really loved learning. I liked the act of learning. I was always a career student, I feel, but once that learning took place, if it were free, I'd continue on more and more. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Me too. Me too. And it, it did click in for me too at the graduate level. I mean, I would not say that I was tapped into the art of learning in college or earlier. I was tapped into the art of memorization. Yeah, and that's the truth too. I realize now why I didn't perform as well in certain areas because I was trying to memorize it rather than learning the process, which would have kind of unraveled it all. But it's really funny to hear you say that. But Denise, we both love learning. If you can learn and have a conversation from any entrepreneur, dead or alive, who are you picking? Mm, so many good choices, but I would have to land on, this is going to sound a little weird, um, William Levere, the founder of Unilever. Okay. Um, he, so he founded, uh, yeah, obviously Unilever, um, starting off with uh, a soap to um, popularize cleanliness and hygiene in England. Um, but uh, the overarching goal of Unilever is to help people look good, feel good, and get more out of life and make okay. sustainable living commonplace. And they have really... Um, from his founding, Unilever has grown into this, huge, you know, obviously huge global company, but, but what they are able to do in the world and how they've been able to be socially responsible while also being profitable is, um, you know, I, I think everybody should model Unilever. Um, I, I love the story that is um, highlighted in the book, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid. Um, and that is how Unilever figured out how to sell like trial size samples for like a penny each in India so that, you know, the, the, um, the impoverished there and the under-resourced could afford good hygiene too. I love it. And in the end, it was a win-win. So I, I would love to, and this was back in the 1800s that he started Unilever. So I would, I would just love to like hear from him what his ethos was. Well, where would this meeting be if you could even pick that? Describe oh, the scenario gosh. for well, us. Oh, gosh. He was in England. I guess I would go to England. Yeah, I'd rather have it in England. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, maybe or maybe Ireland, you know, on a bluff or something. 
<laughs> well, that's really exciting. And if we could travel back in time, we would. But let's look more towards the future here, Denise. We're going to look one year and five years out from now. Where do you see yourself in these entrepreneurial endeavors one year from today? Yeah, I think it goes back to my challenge right now that I will have figured out how to convert um, you know, uh, likes to sales online and really, you know, bring up, bring up my sales, um, business through the online platform with, with a new, with a new fan base. Do you have any plans on how you're going to go about that? Are we going to do courses or how are we going to go about really getting that sound knowledge? Yeah, no, I mean, I think like we discussed before, it's going to be around um, really bringing in some more youthful and knowledgeable folks who, who live and breathe the online space more than I do. <laughs> Absolutely. And well. I'm online and I'm online a lot. I have three Instagram accounts <laughs> and Twitter and Facebook and, and Snapchat and TikTok, but I'm not, but I am not online the way, you know, the 20 something crowd is. Yeah, I've been hearing about TikTok for a while. I just, I don't know if I can bring it, I have too much else going on. It's too hard with the other social media as it is, but eventually I think it would be smart to tap into a new market. Let's look five years, Denise, what are we saying? So my, one of my, so one of the things that makes my business unique or, or that I'm modeling what I have learned and preach is that um, there has to be a social component to my, my, my business. And so right now, every product that I sell uh, gives a percentage to one of three nonprofits that um, I have vetted and support. One nonprofit is, a, um, is an orphanage in India led by Lama Tenzin, um, and he is doing remarkable work in bringing um, abandoned children um, into a home-like environment, giving them a private school education and a career path. It's remarkable. My second nonprofit is um, the Environmental Charter School in LA, and they are doing remarkable work to um, bring get kids four-year college ready and into four-year colleges. Um, and teaching them environmental sustainability so that they can take what they learn back to their communities and have influence there. And then the third nonprofit is a, a local um, aquarium here that really works on the environment and, um, and uh, you know, ocean sustainability. So right now I'm, I'm doing the gift, giving it forward together uh, strategy, which is a portion of my sales go to one of these nonprofits. In five years from now, what I have in my mindset since I started the business is that I am able to convert um, my business, well, not convert, but augment it by bringing an intro to business class to young women and men um, and uh, teach them uh, fundamentals of business through jewelry making and so i'm teaching them jewelry making and i'm teaching them business skills at the same time and they are like part of the craft of aliki designs denise it's time for the spotlight story on each episode i share an entrepreneurial journey to inspire our listeners and i would love your take on it i will now introduce the entrepreneurial journey of sue bryce I had first learned of Sue Bryce in an Inc. article where she was number one on the list of female entrepreneurs who have started a business. Sue was born in New Zealand and raised in Los Angeles. With 30 years experience, she is one of the most recognizable photographers in the imaging industry. She is the CEO and founder of Sue Bryce Education, which is an international community and the most comprehensive portrait education in the world. But I would like to share some quotes I found from her that are really inspiring. My path to self-employment seemed to me a natural evolution, but it wasn't based on a great desire to build a business. Rather, it was born out of necessity. After 13 years mastering my craft, I was still an employee and I simply had reached a ceiling of how much money I could earn in my career. After the initial fear and hurdles, the learning curve is so great I came very close to failure. Instead of giving up, I started to develop a deep sense of passion for motivating and educating myself to reach greater heights in business and income. It became a challenge for me, and I don't know any other way now. 
After 13 years of self-employment, I still challenge myself to create on a larger and larger scale every year. Sue Bryce created this educational platform back in 2014 and is still thriving. Denise, what do you like best about this story? Yeah, I mean, I think it features what we all go through, and that is uh, uh, insecurity, lack of confidence in, in starting and owning um, a business, and, and that it is not easy, yet it can be deeply rewarding, both from an accomplishment standpoint and a growth standpoint. Um, I, I have... I have experienced those lows too, where you think, oh, I'm just gonna throw in the towel. Yep. Um, and, and, but something, I think when you're in the entrepreneurial mindset, you're clued into uh, the universe kind of sending you signs yeah. to keep going. <laughs> and so I've had those, you know, a friend comes to me and says, I need to buy 13 of your bracelets. And it's like, okay, I can't give up now. That's, yeah. that's like a great, you know, like, so, um, or a friend comes and says, I wear my bracelet all the time and it keeps me going. It gives me the strength. Love it gives it. me the courage. Or someone else said to me, a, a guy who was wearing my bracelet in New Zealand said, you know, a friend of mine really needed some courage. And um, the bracelet he was wearing represents courage. Every bracelet I have has a special meaning. And, yep. um, and he gave it to his friend, you know, and so I'm like, okay, that's a sign. I got to keep going with this thing. So, um, but nothing will put you to the test, like having to rely on your good old me, myself, and I to develop something meaningful and, um, and, and to trust in yourself and to have that resiliency and perseverance. Yeah. Yes, yeah, definitely. I can relate to you. For me, it's not as much giving up as just the wondering, like, how long is this going to take? You know, how much work <laughs> am I going to have to put in? Yeah. But Denise, thanks so much for coming on today. I know our listeners are going to see all the value in your episode. I really enjoyed when you talked about your failures, how you're turning it into a positive, how you recognize that, okay, maybe I'm a little weak in the social media space or things that aren't as fluent for my age in business, let's get someone who does know it. And I think that's very valuable because everybody listening on, whether you're starting a business or you're already in one, take the help when you need it because it will help propel you. I loved why you chose your entrepreneur for all the right reasons, but it is time for the last word. And I do this on my other podcast series, A Mental Health Break with Vincent A. Lancey as well, because I want my listeners to really get to know my guests. Is there something that you would like to share with everybody listening on that we didn't get to touch on yet today? Yeah, so much. But I think I'd like to land on on this um, right now with the pandemic and, you know, all the racial uh, tensions that we need to really focus on um, solving and reforming. Um, we all have an opportunity to practice better empathy and kindness and generosity right now. And no more possible is that than among entrepreneurs. Um, like us, who have the agility to set in motion a business or enterprise that incorporates a social good component, whatever that looks like. Love it. Um, and I would like to have a call to action that you know every entrepreneur play a part in helping bolster education, racial justice, care and attention to our most vulnerable populations, sustainability of an environment. And through that, we can literally live into the ancient Greek proverb that says, um, you know, society grows great when people plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit under. I love that. Can you please now share your professional social media website or any ways for our listeners to follow your endeavors and request your services? Absolutely. I am at alikidesigns.com, Instagram, alikidesigns. Facebook, Aliki Designs. <laughs> I made it very easy. Yeah, lucky you. Uh, the name of the show for the podcast on Instagram, it's too many characters. So I was like, ah, oh, and I already done so many episodes where I couldn't rebrand in that way. But oh, funny. Be sure to check out all her great content and it's social media time for the show and we're on whichever platform you like to use. We are at what it's really like to be an entrepreneur on LinkedIn at your favorite morning podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And we're at podcasts by Lancey on Twitter. So you get updates from this show and a mental health break with Vincent A. Lancey. Of course, my handles are at Vincent A. Lancey on all social media and YouTube. And my website is vincentalancey.com.
If you check out my books, DM me. I'd love to hear from you. I have Left for Dead, A Story of Redemption, and How to Transform Your Mindset When the Norm Has Changed, both on Amazon now. And do stay tuned for updates on my upcoming children's books. As always, I will end the show with a quote that inspired me and know it will for you too. This one is from Sue Bryce, the entrepreneur from today's Spotlight story. She said, quote, my desire is to build, create, and learn surpasses my fear. Every challenge I'm faced with now becomes a greater experience of learning my true power. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you all on the next episode of What It's Really Like to Be an Entrepreneur. 